Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live broadcast where my awesome co-host, epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens, and I speak with people from all walks of the publishing industry. Lurking for Legends is a live interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what you hear in the show. So tonight we have epic fantasy author Josh DeLioncourt, and I know that this is called Lurking for Legends, but to me, he is already a legend because his writing is so awesome. So welcome to the show. Josh. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's so great to have you. And why don't we just start out with you telling us a little bit about your books. The series is called The Dragon's Brood Cycle, and you have two novels and two short stories, if I got that right. Yeah, two novels, two short stories. Uh, right now, working on the third novel uh, at the moment. And uh, Basically, uh, the the gist of the story is uh, the main character is a uh, high school hockey star uh, named Emily, and uh, she is uh, growing up in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, her home life is uh, is not the best, and has been deteriorating for some time. And her home life kind of comes to a head at the beginning of the first book. And uh, through, I don't want to spoil too much, I guess, but through a series of strange events, she gets yanked out of what we would think of as the ordinary world and uh, ends up in a world of uh, magic and monsters and uh, that, that has a lot of uh, parallels and, and uh, what seem to be remnants of our world uh, mixed in. And she's got to figure out that why she's there and... Uh, and uh, the series goes from there, basically. And the, the two short stories uh, are basically kind of exploring the backstories of uh, side characters, uh, mainly um, important side characters, but, but kind of secondary characters to the overall uh, story. And uh, of those, uh, Treasures and Trinkets is uh, my favorite. <laughs> it's uh, my favorite thing I've ever written, yeah, I, I think. And uh, uh, feeds in uh, really well to the uh, third book in the series. So, yeah, yeah I, I love that you have a favorite um, thing that you've ever written. If it's kind of sometimes it can be tough to pick one particular thing, but I can see like you know I've read of course Treasures and Trinkets, and it is a truly brilliant short story. It really moves along well, and you know the characters are just really likable. There's a lot to it that makes it a great story. So, you know what what about it for you makes it your favorite to have written? It's um, you know I don't it's it's hard to say exactly. I love the characters that I was writing about in that particular one. Uh, I think. Part of it is that it's uh, it, the, the series as a whole is pretty dark and it's a much more uh, light story. I had a lot of fun writing it, and it was one of those stories that you know the characters basically write the story for you. Like I, I sat down writing it, and I had a little bit of a full start uh, when I first uh, started it. Uh, I was writing it in the third person, and it wasn't really working, and I kind of scrapped some of that and started over again decided you know the, the character the main character of this one, i'm gonna i'm gonna let her tell the story and once i did that uh it all came together and uh, it was one of the fastest things i've ever written i tend to be a bit of a slow writer uh and uh it just uh it just came together so perfectly and so neatly and it, it in the end it it was even more than i had hoped it would be when i started so i was i was very, very happy with how it came out. So you've got the two books in the Dragon's Brood series out right now, and uh, you've got the two uh, tales. And are the tales backstories of, of the main characters, or are they side stories of minor characters, or how do the the, the tale stories fit in with the Dragon Brood series? So, so the uh, the first one is called Harmony Song. Uh, tells the story of uh, of one of the secondary uh, characters from the series. Uh, it's sort of his uh, his background, where where he came from, and uh, how he grew up, and that that sort of thing, uh, and how, ultimately how he ends up uh, where he is when he meets our main, uh, heroine in the, the main series, when he meets Emily in book one. 
Um, so it kind of takes place throughout the, in the years before uh, book one starts, and then uh, the the tail end of it is sort of the uh, you know within a couple of months of where book one uh, begins, and then the second one, Treasures and Trinkets, takes place uh, at the same time as book two, uh, sort of. So it it starts out with the the character uh that that is the main character madeline maddie uh she is the she's a character from uh both books in the in the main series and she uh it, it t- starts out with her uh traveling with uh, a friend of hers uh and and they are traveling at the same time as the second uh book is going on and her path is going to cross again with emily's in the second book but while they're traveling she is telling uh, her friend that she's traveling with, Gallic, uh, the kind of her backstory, kind of how she ended up where she where she is, and uh, she was a, a she. Both of them were uh, prisoners in uh, in a uh, crystal mine, kind of run by the the villain of our uh, series, and uh, she's telling her friend kind of her backstory and how she ended up there and uh her relationship with uh, a servant that she uh knew growing up so it kind of fits in uh both in the the current part of the story as well as uh, a flashback to the the rest of her life and just before this um we were talking we were commiserating about how it can take a while you know to write the next book sometimes and you know we were both saying that both of us have been struggling with our next novel in different ways and i have to agree with you josh that you know mine is has been years in the making which i never thought would happen to me but that is what has happened and it's like kind of anything that can go wrong with a novel has gone wrong and I've had to <laughs> like adjust everything <laughs> literally everything so you know what can you tell us about some of the struggles in you know writing your latest novel I think we can all relate to that kind of stuff sure well you know some of it is uh just the you know just life right life gets in the way and that's that's a, a tough part of uh it when you're trying to focus on a story um a lot of times uh just working on this this book in particular book three has has uh, really kind of struggled to find the i guess the rhythm of it uh it's dealing mainly with kind of two characters uh emily and uh another character from the two uh that are kind of the the primary focus uh in book three and trying to to allow the the back and forth between those two characters they're in different places they're dealing with different things if they get the pacing and the rhythm right between those two parts of it um has been challenging i uh you know a lot of it's gotten written and then kind of scrapped and started over again because uh it just wasn't quite working and uh it's it's going better now but it's still very very slow and uh you know, I think too. You know, a lot of people can relate. I think to the, you know, the last year, right, the pandemic and everything else going on. This has been uh, a bit of a distraction in all of our lives. I think too, and you know, certainly that hasn't helped. And uh, it's 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 slow going, but I think, I think in the end, uh, the book is going to be really really fantastic. Uh, I just uh, I, I had hoped that it would. Would be further along than it is by now and, and maybe done by now but uh but we're getting there we're getting there and uh i'm i can't wait for for everyone to get get to read it yeah i, I think that's true for all of us the, the pandemic is just totally you know even though it's given us like more time at home it still we're so distracted because of it that uh, i think it's hard to actually sit down and get the words done so even though we have more time to write we actually write less it's kind of an odd it's like an oxymoron, I think. But so, how many books do you foresee in the Dragon's Brood series? So, this is book three that you're working on right now, right? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. I said, how many books do you have uh, scheduled for this Dragon? Do you know how many are going? Is do you have like a so, number? In mind or? Yeah, I think it's going to be four, uh, depending on how where I end up with books three and four, it could spill over in five. Uh, I have outlined it for four uh, as we stand right now, but uh, book 
book two ended up really kind of changing things. I wrote book two, part of the plot for book three, I pulled forward into book two, and that made book two end a little sooner in the arc uh, than I'd originally planned. So I, th I still think it's going to wind up being four books, uh, four novels in the end, and probably uh, a couple of other, uh, at least a couple of other short stories and things. Uh, but it's possible it could roll roll out into five, depending. So I will also say just sort of a little addendum, uh, talking about the last year uh, to uh, part of uh, book three has a little bit of uh, part of the storyline deals in, in an environment that's a bit a uh, bit post-apocalyptic and. That's been harder to write in the last year. It's not not been an area I've been super excited to venture into, but, but it's kind of integral to the story. So it's like, I, I don't want to scrap that either. So it, it, that's also kind of slowed things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It's sort of, you know, sometimes you can look forward to that kind of stuff because it's so different from this world. But if it's too similar, it may not be, <laughs> may not right, be exactly. Accurate. <laughs> yeah. And when, when the when the story was mapped out, it was long before you know the the events of this last year. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. I've tried to I've tried to uh, minimize it a little bit because I I don't know how even how much people want to be reading that sort of thing right now. So right, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, Christy. Oh, I was going to say, is there any way I can persuade you to write something more like 10 books in the Dragon's Brood series? <laughs> How many can I push you to write? <laughs> because I really enjoy it and your fans really enjoy it too. Yeah, I've, I've actually got another book that I have been kind of working on off and on for a few years that's completely separate from the Dragon's Brood cycle. And it's one of those projects that... that yeah, it's one of those projects I keep just kind of dipping into, and I write a little more here, a little more there, and um, I'm hoping that at some point before too long, that one that one may uh, may grab enough of my, uh, or at least instill enough inspiration uh, that uh, maybe I really really sit down and and hammer the rest of it out. But uh, it's a uh, it's a fun. It's a it's a fun series. It's it's got supernatural elements, like pretty much everything that I write. But it's uh, it's it's a could not be more different <laughs> from the Dragon's Bird cycle. So, is this the one that includes western of some sort? Yeah, yeah. Wow, uh, you have a good memory. It's uh, yeah, it's like a supernatural <laughs> western story. Yep, that's that's what it is. I didn't even remember that I'd shared that previously with you. So that's impressive. I, I, well, I read one of, I read a few of your interviews. So uh, that's where oh, I was okay. getting it. I okay. like, uh, I keep up with all the things that you do. So, you know, I love yeah. uh, seeing what you're up to. That's cool. I, I was looking through uh, your website and I found it interesting that while I was looking through dragonsbrew.net, and I clicked on the bio, it automatically switched me to lioncord.com. Now, is that two totally different websites and they're just integrated? I thought that was very interesting. All of a sudden I looked up in my uh, my browser yeah, bar. So, so yeah, yeah. lioncord.com is kind of like my, I guess, author site or, or, or what have you. Uh, the dragonsbrew.net website is like for the series specifically. And uh, it was one of those things, if I had it to do all over again, I'd probably have just had one site for both things. It just sort of worked out, but, uh, but I ended up with both. So, but uh, yeah. I thought that was very interesting, the way they, uh, they're they they're integrated. So when you click on one, it just switches from one site to another. And it's seamless. Like I had no idea until I realized the tabs are all different at the top. I mean, what's going on? I thought I'd done something wrong. Uh, well, it's it's supposed to be pretty seamless. Uh, the the site yeah. kind of designed to ha have the same look and and uh, that sort of thing. So the uh, although the the uh, dragonsbrew.net has a lot of stuff that that uh, it, you know is not on the lightcourt.com one, like the uh, uh, a lot of artwork of the characters and things like that. Right. But uh, a, comic, a comic book artist friend of mine uh, drew those and. Uh, and things like that that make make more sense on a series site, I think. 
Yeah, oh, for sure. And while I was in there too, I was. You also had your audiobooks uh, listed, and I'm probably going to say her name wrong, but it's Raya. Ray Kaplan is your narrator. Ray Kaplan. Yep, she is the narrator of all of the audiobooks. Uh, Trojan mm -hmm. Trinkets just came out a few months ago on audio. Uh, that's the the most recent uh, release that I uh, I've got, and uh, she is just fantastic. She is an amazing narrator. I got so incredibly lucky uh, getting to work with her. Yeah, oh, for sure. And I, I, the first teaser for uh, the first Dragon's Brood book, uh, there was music in the background. Is that just for the teaser or do you have sound effects and music throughout all the audiobooks? Uh, you know, I don't remember where that music uh, is from. I have not watched that video in a long time. The um, I know the music for the uh, Treasure and Trinkets uh, audiobook uh, trailer uh, was uh, written by a friend of mine uh, and was based on some music that I've written that's also features in the uh, in the audiobooks as well. And the the short story Har harmony song has a uh, song companion that goes uh, with it also uh, in the audiobook and you can listen to it on the website that my wife sings so there's a lot of music uh kind of all over the place in the uh in the series uh, i'm a musician i i record music uh as well and so i've wanted to incorporate some of that into into the series and i've had a lot of fun doing that I think that's especially cool because, you know, I mean, the fact that you're writing this music and maybe your wife is singing some of it or all of it or, you know, any involvement from the author on extra parts like that is extra exciting, I think. I, I find it really, really fun to know that it's not just something where, you know, the author listened to some separate music and was like, yeah, that fits. It's something from you. So it really suits yeah yeah thank you i i love doing it i love the uh the music part of it and i mean i love all that kind of extra like extra material when whenever you know any sort of author series or whatever has that sort of stuff it's also why uh i had the artist uh friend of mine Leanne hannah uh draw, you know draw the pictures of the characters she reads the series loved the series and kept saying yeah i really want to draw these characters and so finally last year we're like you know what let's just do it let's get it done and uh and we did, and I, I love having those those kinds of things, the uh, the art and the music and and the audio books, and I I, I really enjoy all of those those extra little things and the and the short stories as well. There's a, uh, a, a another indie author that I uh, hugely enjoy. His name is Drew Hayes, and he is like the king of doing this. He has written a ton of stuff. Uh, in uh, many many series i wish i was even an eighth as prolific as he is it's, he just keeps cranking him out I don't, I don't know how he has time to eat but yeah. uh he has done this where he's got uh ser you know, several series he's got uh side series uh side books in some of those series he's uh got audio dramatizations like kind of like old radio show type of things versions of wow. uh some of the books that he's worked with uh, graphic audio to produce he's he has just done a ton of stuff and i just i love that i love love what he's done um uh, and you know kind of wanted to do similar things kind of follow in, in that vein and Get as much extra stuff out there uh, as i can and if, if you've not read drew hayes he's he it is very different than my stuff. His stuff is uh, very, very light, very lighthearted and, and fun uh, books, but they are, and, and hilarious. He's an incredibly funny uh, writer. And uh, I really recommend his stuff. He's, he's really great. You know, uh, before this, we were talking a little bit about, you know, there are so many things we sometimes have to delete from our books that sometimes we'll put them aside as deleted scenes. And I wasn't sure. I, I, sit or, I seriously do that. I literally do that. And I will give them to my patrons only. And I was wondering if you share deleted scenes anywhere. I haven't. I have thought about doing so, particularly the ones that are kind of like you know the paths untraveled or whatever things where i decided way through to uh 
to change something uh, up. And so I ended up with like a chapter or two that just no longer fit, no longer makes sense. Um, there are a few of those from there. I don't know if there's any of those from book one. Book one was a, uh, was a, I, I wish more, everything I wrote would would uh, come out the way that book one did in, in the fact that I sat down to write book one and I, well, yeah, I take that back. I think there is a like half a chapter uh, it's from book one that got, got scrapped and I got saved in my deleted scenes folder. But for the most part, um, book one is as it was written. I, I sat down, I wrote it in, I wrote in three months and then did a ton of rewriting afterward because it, it needed it. But uh, very little got cut from from the first book. The second book, um, which was a little bit more of a journey to to get put together, uh, there's quite a few uh, bits and pieces and, and whole chapters that just ended up on kind of on the cutting room floor. I have thought uh, thought about sharing some of those. Uh, there's one chapter that is uh, um, just sort of a, like a, a background chapter, kind of giving you some more uh, information on a character that I just decided wasn't necessary, but might be might be fun to rework as a, you know, maybe a little short story or something like that. I'm not sure, but uh, I haven't have not um, shared any of those anywhere. I, I keep thinking about it and uh, maybe, maybe eventually, maybe eventually. I, and I, ha I actually do have, uh, as you know, Christy, another short story that I've been sitting on for a while trying to decide what to do with. <laughs> so it's very, very short. It will come out uh, eventually. I just haven't decided yet if I want to release it on its own because it's it seems kind of too short to uh, release by itself. Uh, if I want to tack it on uh, to another release somewhere, I just, I haven't quite decided yet. So Stingy maybe, Jack. yeah. So maybe put these little short scenes into a little anthology through the Dragon's Brood cycle. That would be kind of a neat thing for the readers to read all these little short stories in one book. Might be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the short stories and I, uh, yeah, maybe maybe the uh, maybe the Sinji Jack story should be one of those things. It just gets uh, kind of like you were talking about doing with, with the deleted scenes. Maybe I should just toss that up on the website or something as a uh, something that uh, the fans can download or whatever and, and check out if they want. But uh, I love I love doing that, and I've got I've got a few more short story ideas. Uh, uh, kind of uh, that I've been kicking around and uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of those will uh, will see the light of day sooner than later as well. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of uh, these deleted scenes and that, are you a plotter or a pantser then? So if you've, do you plot all these and then some just don't fit once you've got the story going or are you a pantser and all of a sudden you realize after the fact that some of these scenes aren't fitting anymore? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Are you a, as a writer? Would you plot your stories out, or do you uh, what they call? It? There's a there's a there's a nice name for it. I call it a pantser. I I, I can't remember what the, I've seen it recently, but the, there's a different a special name for. It's like a discovery writer. Is it discovery writer? Discovery it, yeah. writer. <laughs> discovery writer yeah. uh, I, I'm a little bit of both. So uh, the way that I tend to write, I think. I want to say someone else, uh, uh, maybe it was Rachel Aaron, I think. There was another author recently who uh, wrote about their uh, creative process. And I was like, oh, that's what I do. And I never really had a name for it per se. I, I kind of think of it as like touchdowns, but I basically have a, a loose outline uh, that I have for the, for the series and for each individual book in, in the series. And within those, I kind of just have like these are what I what I'm tended to call the, the touchdowns. These are the the moments that I need to be working toward, and probably you know roughly in this order. Although sometimes they can get switched around, and everything in between those, I kind of let the characters carry it along. And as long as I think we're still heading in the right direction, um, I I let the characters kind of dictate where the story goes and. That that works pretty well uh, for me. I am not one of these uh, writers who uh, sits down and and plots out every 
single detail of the each that for me part of part of the fun of of writing is is you know probably one of the most fun things about writing is when the characters surprise you by by doing something you don't expect or derailing something that you thought was going another way and as long as I can keep the main story uh, on track uh, I I I think it's best and and it more authentic to let the characters uh, do what they want and and be be who they they are and I, I know it sounds weird to say that about fictional characters but they uh you know they, they take on a life of their own after a while and uh and uh i i enjoy just kind of allowing them to run with it and yeah sometimes that means you you end up in strange places and you either cut stuff or you know you have to adjust something in your ear plot to make it all work but i i've never regretted letting the uh, letting the characters take over uh, as long as they don't go too 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 astray so that's what i was going to ask actually i was going to ask um you know what you said is absolutely right these characters do take on a life of their own and i i also think that that is the best part of being a pantser or just in general writing um but i was going to ask has have you ever had a character make a decision that you were not thrilled about and that was either difficult to come back from or that you had to sort of deny them somehow. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, there've been, there've been a couple of those times. I'm trying to think of, um, try, trying to think of a, like a really good example of that. I guess probably the, uh, probably the best example of that was in, uh, in the one, uh there's a a character who i don't I, I don't want to give too much away for anybody who hasn't pick, picked up the books yet but basically there's a character um who i had really kind of defined in my head that this is this is a a you know for lack of a better term you know a good guy or whatever um and he he does some questionable things kind of toward the end that uh i wasn't uh wasn't entirely happy with and wasn't exactly where i thought it was going to go and then i ended up spending a lot of book two uh working out you know where where i spent a lot of time in book two working out why is he where he is uh why does he feel the way he does and uh and what is what does that mean for the rest of his arc and in the end i think it was uh really much better for that because he uh, he's, he's a much more complicated character than when i first uh, envisioned him when you know when he first came onto the, the scene in the first first book so i'm pretty pretty pleased with how that went in in the long run but i i was uh not thrilled <laughs> in the end but didn't didn't feel like it was um you know exactly my place to change it right they like you say they take a take on a life of their own and uh i don't i don't like contradicting that because i think the the readers notice if you do that either too much or too forcefully and then the characters stop they, they stop feeling like people and start feeling like pawns that you're moving on a game board and i really dislike books where the characters feel that way so that's a great point. They they start to feel. I like the way you described it, like pawn, pawns that are moving around, and it can be even tough to sort of rationalize for the reader how they're doing or why they're doing things. And this is where you end up with rationalizations that don't always work, you know. But you can also have wooden characters that just feel like characters, not like people you know. So I yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying. Yeah. So it's it's been an interesting. Uh... It's an inter the whole creative process is an interesting uh, road to walk, I guess, because uh, it's it it's always full of surprising things, and you know, like, mm -hmm. a lot of times, best best laid plans can get uh, get knocked aside, and and sometimes, almost always, that's for the best. So, definitely, <laughs> it certainly makes it exciting. So, so all your books now. I saw a comment there where all your books, you've got all your books wide. So you're in Apple and Kobo and Nook. 
At, at one point, were you just strictly in Amazon and in Kindle Limited, and then you've branched out, or have you always been wide? So I, uh, as far as the, the uh, distributors? Yeah, as far as when you publish your books, uh, when you go Kindle Unlimited, you're restricted to your ebooks are restricted to Amazon. Yeah, so yeah, so I, I have been in and out. So when I when the first when I released my first book, I went wide, um, and then after a couple, of, and I think it was I think it coincided with the release of book two. I decided to try, uh, you know, going on Kindle Unlimited and. Uh, and and of course that uh, requires exclusivity to Amazon, and I did that for a while, and that worked really well for about a year, and mm -hmm. then it all completely dried up entirely. So uh, about a year ago or so, I, I decided to take uh, everything wide uh, there again, and then just recently, uh, I have been kind of experimenting with. Uh, with going wide with the audiobooks as well. So Harmony Song uh, audiobook is available uh, wide now. Uh, the other ones are still uh, restricted to Audible and iTunes. But uh, I plan on probably uh, releasing the rest of those wide uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, book it's, it's a little bit difficult right now because book one is tied up uh, in an exclusivity contract with Audible that's uh, through the end of 2022, I think. So uh, but once uh, once that kind of runs out and probably with, with uh, Treasures and Trinkets before then, I'm going to uh, continue to put the, the, the audiobooks out wide as well. And I'm not really sure it's a little too soon yet to know how well that's going to uh, pan out, but in general, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, wide releases. As a reader, I certainly prefer wide releases because I personally don't uh, don't read a lot of stuff, uh, like ebooks and Kindle. I, I'm an Apple guy, and I I like uh, Apple books. And I uh, accessibility wise, uh, as a as a visually impaired person, uh, the accessibility of Apple books is much much better than Kindle, uh, so they're easier to read and. And such. So I uh, I prefer it when authors have stuff wide. But I, you know, the business side, you got to kind of do what works for you. And I've kind of dabbled on both sides. And I think more and more, I'm settling into the. I think the the wide releases are are probably the uh, the 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 way that I I want to continue going in, into the future anyway. That's interesting. And I, I like what you said about uh, the Kindle Unlimited. It, and it's probably true. Like they've got a, I know there's a lot of people that read Kindle Unlimited, but you know, at some point that's going to dry up. And, uh, you know, you're just preaching and you're advertising to the same people over and over and over again. And once they've read your book, they're not going to read it again. So going wide is probably, you know, a nice strategy to do after the Kindle Unlimited for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the I was, I, you know, the Kindle Unlimited thing was a bit frustrating because because I started wide because then I had to yank everything out of the other stores in order to try to get a loan limited thing, and then thought, oh, this is working pretty well, and then you know after about a year or so, it starts to dry up. You're like, oh, now I, now I have to go through all the work again of putting everything back in all the other stores, and it's it's, yeah. a, it's a lot of work and. You know, I, I don't I, I I don't know that I want to say I regret having traded. I, I think it's good that that I did that I went down that path and tried it out. But boy, I uh, it, it was it was a lot of extra work uh, for myself in the end, and not not something I plan on, on experimenting with uh, anytime soon. Anyway, but I went went wide again about a year ago, and uh, you know. I think there were definitely people who, you know, weren't picking up the books because they weren't on whatever platform they mm -hmm. they happened to prefer. So, yeah. Um, so there was a little little bit of a bump throughout the, the year last year. It's tricky, you know. It's very hard to know where you're going to get the best return. It's it is gambling. You just never really know what the answer will be. And we have um, 
We have J.D. Estrada, who is a fellow author of uh, almost any genre you could want to read. And he says, I'm considering getting out of KDP Unlimited. Can't say I've seen a major benefit. And then he also says, curious that Unlimited is kind of limited from the author side, which it, it is. I think they just named it that to attract readers, of course. But right. um, for us, exactly as you say, J.D., it's extremely limiting. And it is difficult in exactly the way you said, Josh, where then you have to format everything and put it back out. And, you know, especially if you pulled things from wide, that is very frustrating. Oh, I hate that. It, it really is. And, I, you know, I think, too, the one limited, it really depends on your genre. Right, like mm -hmm. that, that is a huge part of it. Yeah. Like the the romance genre is, seems to be anyway huge on Kindle mm -hmm. Unlimited, uh, okay. whereas uh, you know something like like what I write, that sort of sci-fi fantasy type stuff, is a little bit more hit and miss. And there there are authors that have had you know success in that genre. Like Drew Hayes, that I was talking about earlier, is uh, is one of them. And he's got some of his books in Kindle Unlimited, some of them not. He pulls them in and out all the time. I I don't know what his calculus is for it, but he seems to do really uh, pretty well in, in Kindle Unlimited. And that's great. If it works for you, you know, more power to you. I, I found that it worked for, for me for a while and then, and then stopped working. So it's, it's going to, your mileage is going to vary. I think that depending on, uh, you know, your fan base, depending on the genre you write in, depending on just so many factors. And it's, it's a little bit frustrating. That Amazon makes it as difficult as they do. I wish, uh, I wish that the you know, that, that to, you could do Kindle Unlimited without the exclusivity, even if maybe you had to make some other concession. The exclusivity, I think, makes it really hard for a lot of authors to to know what to do and to decide what to do. I totally agree. Why can't there be some other kind of concession? Like you said, even if it was like we have to have some kind of special version that you can't put anywhere, like let's say it was a book club version and you can't put the book club version elsewhere, but you can put the plain you know, version. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways they could probably manage to have something special for themselves, but allow us to go wide at the same time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, I mean, the way that Audible uh, deals with this, which is, you know, not the best either, but is, you know, they cut your royalty <laughs> if you're not exclusive. And it's like, all right, well, you know, they could, you know, Amazon could do something like that. Not not that you're getting, you know, a ton from Kindle Unlimited either. I suppose it'd be hard to cut that down too much further than where it is. But something, you know, they could do something else, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a lot more lucrative for most of the indie authors, for sure. So getting beyond that, uh, I also noticed that uh, you host and participate in several podcasts. And so what are they about and uh, how are they different from one another? If you're doing more than one, what is the difference between them? Well, I do fewer podcasts than I, uh, than I used to. <laughs> but uh, the, kind of the, the main show that I'm still uh, uh, doing a lot now is called Master's Cast, which is a uh, Masters of the Universe fan podcast. I, I grew up uh, a, a fan of Masters of the Universe, which was a cartoon, comic book, toy line property that if you're old enough, you probably remember. And if you're not, you probably don't. Uh, but Richard is I, waving at you. <laughs> I, I remember. Uh, so uh, so I, I grew up with that, a uh, huge fan uh, of it. And I've uh, been part of that uh, fan community for 25 years now online, I think at least. And uh, I got to work actually on uh, uh, some of the uh, the uh, things that have come out for that series. Uh, Dark Horse Comics uh, a few years ago uh, did a uh, character guide and world compendium, and uh, which is uh, basically a, a big encyclopedia of all the characters and and uh, things from the series, and locations and items and ma different kinds of magic and all kinds of things from the series. And I got to work on that. Uh, and uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And so the, the, uh, the fan podcast is a, a thing that we've, we've been uh, doing since 2005, me and my co-hosts. And uh, it's just a, just a fun thing to talk about this, the series and the, you know, there's new stuff going on with that all the time. There's a New uh, cartoon uh, produced by Ken Smith coming out on Netflix in a couple of months, and that's going to be fun. 
and uh, it's a it's a it's a fun property. And I mean, it it is why I have the love of fantasy that I do. Is uh, growing up with that series. I I watched it as a kid. I saw that series before I lost my vision. Uh, that series was was on and uh, on TV, and I, I loved it. And lost my vision when I was uh, six years old. And remember, you know, I remember the show. I remember how everything looked. And you know, that's a part of my love for the series that's carried on through the years is uh, the fact that you know it's connected in with my my memories of being able to see and that sort of thing. And when I lost my vision, the uh, the producers of the show actually got the the two main uh, actors in the show to record in character a message that they sent to me, which was a lot of uh, fun oh. back back in 1983. So that's a long time ago, 84, I guess. Um, awesome. And so, uh, so I, I've got a lot, of, a lot of nostalgia, a lot of love for the series and the people that worked on the series. And actually, also uh, because of all that, because of the the producers uh, creating the um, that cassette tape where they recorded, they recorded for me a message and wishing me well and everything after I lost my vision. Because of all of that, uh, I actually ended up uh, being interviewed on the. Uh, DVD releases back in the uh, mid 2000s. So if you can find the original DVD releases of the series, I am in uh, quite a few of the documentaries throughout that uh, thing on the extras. So it's a, it's it's a huge been a huge part of my life. Still is a huge part of my life. I uh, I collect the action figures. I watch the shows. I talk about it on a podcast. I am a complete nerd, and I'm okay <laughs> with that. So <laughs> that so where do people find this podcast? What would they do? What's that? Where would people find the podcast? Masterscast.com is where the podcast is. We, we record pretty irregularly. It depends on uh, what's going on in the property. Uh, so uh, the the uh, She-Ra side of it uh, had a new series on Netflix. So we watched that and discussed that a lot in the show. And that, that ended last year. And uh, when the uh, when the new series on Netflix uh, that Kevin Smith is doing uh, gets going, uh, we'll be doing more episodes. I'm sure, uh, sure then. So, so for um, other people, other writers who may also be visually impaired, can you tell them what software you use to write and maybe even to blog, whatever is easiest to work with, because that could really help them move forward in a much smoother way. Sure. So I'm a I'm an Apple guy. I think I said that earlier. <laughs> uh, I use uh, you know Macs and iPads and iPhones and all that stuff. And uh, uh, Apple's accessibility in general is uh, really great. And uh, I've been uh, a, a fan of all of their their work in the accessibility realm for uh, for a long time. They've got a built-in uh, screen reader uh, on everything everything they make. Uh, and so uh, I, with that, I use Scrivener for uh, my writing, which I, a, a tool a lot of you authors use. Uh, I mainly do the, the actual writing uh, on the iPad uh, version of Scrivener, and, uh, which you can uh, sync with your uh, Mac version. And then when, I, when it's time to Really uh, nail down the formatting, get the uh, get the ebooks ready. Uh, uh, a lot of the editing, a lot of that stuff takes place on the Mac, but the uh, the initial draft I do on the uh, on the iPad version. And uh, liter literature and latte, the company that makes it, uh, has been just uh, fantastic in terms of supporting uh, accessibility in the app, and even when. Uh, you know, I, I ran into years ago, I told the story a few places, but a few years ago, uh, when I was first working on uh, Haven Lost, the first book in the series, and I ran into a feature in the app that I uh, couldn't, couldn't access, couldn't, the screen reader uh, could not could not see it, tell me about it, couldn't use it. And I contacted them. They gave me a workaround, not only uh, a workaround to, to solve the problem so I could I could use the feature without without it working in the app, but gave me the instructions for going through all of that from the perspective of a blind user using the screen reader on the back that I was using. Um, you know, what, what screen reader commands I needed to use to do what. And I, I'm a pretty advanced user, so I didn't need all that, but I really appreciated the fact that they cared enough to know how to use the, 
the uh, screen reader and explain what uh, you know, what what I needed to do. And, you know, just for other you know users out there that maybe uh, not used to going in and editing XML files, which is what you had to do uh, to, to get around this problem. Uh, you know, that was uh, that would be incredibly helpful. So just the fact that they cared enough was uh, was pretty outstanding. So they. Uh, I, I cannot say enough good things about uh, literature and latte and scrivener and uh, even the app in general. It's just just really really good. It's it's a incredibly powerful app. It's incredibly complicated. It definitely has a learning curve, but I don't know how I would do what I do without it. So I think I started using it once you told me about it. I think uh, I think you are the one who got me started with it and. I think, and I never looked back, honestly, because it made such a huge difference to my writing process. As you say, it's a, it's, you know, it just has a million things you can do. And I am definitely not at the level of using it that you are, uh, you know, a lot about, about it that I don't, you know, all the secret Easter eggs and stuff. And I don't actually know all that stuff. Um, I do sometimes pop into courses and, and learn more, but I write out of order and it was really the only way that I could feel, um, like I could keep writing out of order without having to reorganize and reorganize in Word. It was very difficult for me and it really ruined my process. I was finding it very hard for long works. So, you know, Scrivener, I agree with you. I can't say enough about it. And from your perspective, from my perspective, it is just a really awesome software. One of my favorite features in there, uh, just to take a real short side trip here, one of my favorite features in there for what, I, what I'm what i doing with, with my book series, with the Dragon's Bridge Cycle, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, research that I've done uh, over the years or things that I've wanted to refer back to. And one of the things that uh, is great is you can take, if you've got like a web page, like I, I, there's information on this web page or this Wikipedia page or whatever it is that I know I'm going to need to refer to as as I'm writing. Uh, you can actually uh, add those into the uh, into your Scrivener project uh, in their entirety, and you don't even have to leave Scrivener to jump back to the web page and look up something uh, while you're writing, which is just uh, just fantastic. I, I love that feature, and it has probably saved me countless hours over the, over the years. Yeah, I started using that too. And it it also helps me. I totally agree. And they had this other feature. And I don't know if they had it before Scrivener 3. I can't remember. But well, at least I didn't know about it. Uh, something where it will highlight any like form of um, grammar or language that you want. So like you could say, for example, um, show me all the verbs and it will just highlight all of those. And, you know, maybe in the accessibility version, it would read them to you or something like that. So you can right, see if right. you're overusing something and that does make it easier it is surprising when you overuse things and you just don't catch it in the reread you know you're just not hearing it or if you're reading it out loud or you're just not seeing it if you're reading it on the screen and all of a sudden you're like oh my god i can't believe i did that <laughs> that's crazy yeah nothing i tell you nothing will let you know that you are overusing a word or a phrase or whatever than listening to someone else narrate your audiobook <laughs> let me just say that so there have been a few <laughs> few times where i've been oh man i really wish i could just go change this one phrase in book two because i just once one too many times in this chapter i used that phrase but uh, in general, uh, yeah, that, that's got to be a great tool. I'm going to have to uh, see how that, uh, how that works because uh, I, I haven't used that particular one. I have used the, the one that gives you this, uh, I forget, I think it's in the stats window where it'll actually just give you every word that you've used in the book and the number of times you've used it. And it's just a giant list that you could scroll through. Um, right. See, so, which is, uh, kind of an interesting thing, and you can you can definitely see uh, things that you you may be overusing. I didn't yeah. realize that. Now I have something to look up too. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I've, I actually have a list that I have written down on Microsoft Word, and I go through my book and try to see how many times I've used certain words and try to get rid of them, you know, weak words or whatever. Sometimes I keep, I keep the weak words. Uh, CJD Estrada used the word just. I don't use just very often, but every now and then, you know, it is a word and it's there for a reason. And every now and then 
to use just works. It just works. So, you know, there's a, there's not a golden rule for everything, but just moderation, I think, with a lot of these things. But and anyway, uh, I think we're uh, near the end of our podcast, or not our podcast, our video cast. You got me on podcast now. So I would like to thank you uh, for joining us today. And uh, we really enjoyed hearing about your books and uh, your journey. And uh, we uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, you're able to write uh, even with the disability. That's, uh, that's, a, that's awesome. And I, I would commend you for that. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. It's always yeah. great talking to you. Yeah. And just uh, just on a, a note for Christy, I'm not sure if you have anything new you want to add today or this week, or you've got anything special coming up? No, um, just that The Artist is coming out on March 30th, so we are less than half a month away, and I'm really looking forward to that. That one is wide, so you can buy it from anywhere, and I'm really looking forward to seeing readers' feedback. I already have a review on Goodreads, so you can check that out to see what people think so far, and I'm really excited for that one. It's uh, it's taken longer than I had hoped, but um, boy, has the journey been worth it. It's It's really been fun. Awesome. I hope you do very well with it. And I've got my uh, audiobook Into the Madness. It's the third one, the Soul Forge Saga. It is in Audible's hands right now. And uh, I'm Mikhail Roberts, who's actually going to be here in, uh, I think, April 20th. He's going to be on uh, with us. And so we'll get to chat with my narrator. He does an amazing job. His voices are incredible. So we're just waiting on Audible to release it. Hopefully it'll be before the end of uh, March. So next week, join us again on March 23rd as we uh, switch it up a bit. And we speak with science fiction and fantasy author Allegra Pescatore, who I inadvertently used her picture when I was trying to advertise this segment today. And I apologize to both Josh and Allegra. My wife came in and fixed it after Christy showed us. And uh, so, and she would love to talk about uh, disability representation in genre fiction. So that sounds like it should be very interesting to hear that spin on it. And I'm looking forward to hearing that. So. Until then, uh, this has been another uh, Lurking for Legends live video cast. As always, thank you to my wonderful co-host, Christy Stratos, and our guest, fantasy author, Josh DeLioncourt. Thank you for being with us tonight. And until we meet again, uh, take care and please keep safe.